Let the seed of your word be planted in our hearts and let it take root as we share one of the most important gifts you've given us, Lord, the gift of grace. And Lord, use me as, as you will. In your name, amen. So I've been <laughs> struggling with a sermon for a long... Oh, I just got the word from the sound person. <laughs> She's not my wife. She's a sound person now. Um, got all kinds of authority now. Uh, but I've been struggling for like the past two weeks to come up, and I couldn't figure it out. And yesterday, Tracy brought my lunch or, or dinner over, and she said, well, let's go for a walk. And Because I, I was just getting worked up, because I couldn't get any traction, and it wasn't the, the topic. But it turned out it was kind of the topic. Because, remember, we're doing a study of Acts. And every time we come to a different section where, for example, Paul wrote the book of Galatians, first uh, epistle he wrote was after his first missionary tour. So now we're jumping over to the book of Galatians because we just got done studying the people of Galatia. And now we're going to talk about what Paul was writing to him about. But I don't do I don't, we're covering a huge topic today and trying to fit it in to only like a three hour sermon. So... <laughs> Yeah, you know, no, it, it won't be that long, but it, it was a—it's a hard thing to do. So you know, this is what it is. This is what God's given me, and and you know, we're going to talk about grace today. Um, it's so important to believers. One that keeps getting blurred by a lot of people who profess to be Christians, and grace should not be a blurry subject. Um, Grace is not just a catch-all phrase, one which can be misunderstood in so many contexts, as we'll see. Uh, to a lukewarm uh, Christian or a church in, or a Christian name only, grace is a get-out-of-hell-free card. While to a legalist, grace is a good start, but you need more. But to a true believer, they are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I think Martin Luther said that. Remember, Paul's writing this letter to the churches in Galatia to counter a false gospel. This is a false gospel. Remember, Galatia is a primarily a Gentile region. It was in a, a Turkey, or they called it Asia at the time, but it was in Turkey. Um, and, you know, he went there, and they'd never been under the law. They were Galatians. They were Gentiles. And so for the first two chapters... They, they, he gave his authority. He gave him their creden his credentials as, as an apostle because he heard disturbing things coming out of the churches that he planted. One that said, oh yeah, salvation in Christ is a great start, but you need to obey the law of Moses. Let's turn to Galatians 3 because now he's going to get into the meat of his letter. Uh, Galatians 3. Right after Second Corinthians. <laughs> All right. He begins to deal with issues of law and grace. And Paul was not one to beat around the bush about these things, about his displeasure. These churches had accepted the gospel of free grace, saw that the Holy Spirit was being poured out them, they saw miracles happen, heard true biblical teaching, yet now they were listening to, suddenly to false teachers. Judaizers who were saying, yes, Jesus paid the price for your sin, but it only counts if you become a Jew first. And not just the law that, you know, because let's face it, a lot of the law isn't observable. How do you tell if someone really loves God? You know? Well, they went to temple. Does that mean they love God? Is, is, is a Christian someone who goes to church? You know, are you a car if you stand in your garage and make car sounds? No. So the Judaizers realized this and they said, well, you have to obey the observable part of the law. For men, because in this age in society, men were what was important. So they had to obey the physical uh, <coughs> part of the law. So, 
circumcision had to be something that they could observe. And so they said circumcision, anyone that's going to be a Christian has to be circumcised. And they did this because at any point they could look under the hood and say, yep, Jewish. But it meant nothing by itself. Circumcision, like baptism, is an outward sign. Circumcision was meant to make Jewish people stand out from among the nations. It had been given to them by God as an outward covenant that God made with them. Circumcision didn't make anyone better. Just as baptism doesn't make you a better person. It does nothing for you unless it's an internal change. Frankly, God wanted a different type of circumcision from his people. He wanted them to be changed on the inside first. In Deuteronomy 10.16, it says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. Remember, this stubbornness is a heart issue. As we saw last week, the unbelievers in Canaan, when, when Rahab the harlot was there, you know, they knew, they heard the miracles from 40 years before that God had opened up the Red Sea, all the miracles that freed all these Jews from, from Egyptian slavery, but it stopped there. It didn't change their attitude. It never stopped them from worshiping idols and turned to Jehovah God. And likewise, the Hebrews who saw the miracles experienced them. Remember, 40 years prior, had come right to the border of the Promised Land, looked at the people there and said, oh no. And they walked out, and the, the desert was littered with their bones. They never really changed their hearts to God. They never became, and it became evident. Remember, every time they get in the wilderness, something bad would happen. Oh, we're almost out of food. Oh, we have no water. What was their first response? Let's go back where the meat pots were overflowing. We had bread all the time. You know, I guess that was a slave meal. Um, but... Or, you know, did you bring us out here just to die? You know, they would grumble about God. They would grumble about Moses. So, and it was always, at one point, God got so fed up, I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'll start a new line with you, Moses. And then other times, Moses would say, just wipe them out, God. And he'd say, no, no, I got this. You know, they're insulting me, not you. It was frustrating. But these are people who went through miracles. They could walk through the Red Sea on dry land and they could see fishes coming up. Fishes? They could see fish coming up on the sides and it didn't bother them. Water would just appear out of rocks. Food appeared. Well, okay. Miracles don't increase, don't make faith. They increase what faith is there and they didn't have it. In Deuteronomy 29.4, Moses warned, But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. See, they, these, these people who were going about to invade the land, Moses saw them and said, you know, they're not here yet. They're doing things because I'm their leader and they saw what happened to the last generation, but it wasn't an outward following or it was a surface kind of following. But Moses saw a day coming through a gift of prophecy or a vision of prophecy. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he said, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, notice, will, so future tense, and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and, with all, and that you may live. He almost got carried away. I believe that while some of this prophecy was talking about when the Jewish people returned from exile, Moses was looking further ahead, like, like 23,000, 2300 years ahead. It meant something more. He was looking to a day that when Ezekiel later on would prophesy. Okay, let's flip over to Ezekiel. I haven't heard any pages flip. Ezekiel 36, and hold on to Galatians. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 28. God says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. 
I will put within you, and I will remove the harder stone from your flesh and give you a harder flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I honestly believe that's Moses looking forward to a day when God's spirit was poured out. First at Pentecost to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Romans 2 verses 28 and 29 seems to support this where Paul writes, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Children of Abraham are made by God through His Spirit. Jews were not only through hereditary means, but made by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul now gets down to his corrections. Now we can flip back to Galatians, which I hopefully you held on to. Because I didn't. So. Starting in verse 1 of Galatians 3. Oh, foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, remember, the churches in Galatia were predominantly Gentile nations. And in other words, they never lived under the law of Moses. They they, they probably didn't even know what it was at the time, except that's what the Jewish people followed. However, now they were being misled by a fake gospel. Paul pointedly reminds them of the origins of their origins by asking, "What brought the Holy Spirit to them? Was it that someone shared the law of, and the law brought it? No. It's because they heard the gospel of Jesus, how God loved them so much that He sent His only Son to die for them and accepted Him in faith as Lord of their lives. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they saw great miracles happen. Then they could sit under great godly teaching, and then they grew. And Paul continues in verse 6 with an example of Abraham. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it was those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Again, Paul points to it. Being a son of Abraham didn't mean just that you're in the lineage. Remember when, when they were asking John the Baptist about you know, uh, you know, what should we do? And he's like, you know, don't, don't think that just you're going to be saved or enter the kingdom of heaven just because you're a child of, you, you say you're a child of Abraham. It doesn't work that way. You know, he said, God can make these stones into uh, children of Abraham. So Paul redefines what it meant, stating that children of Abraham were those who truly believed in faith. And something he'd later make clear in this this, uh, same chapter. In verse 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul reveals that this was the meaning of God's covenant with Abraham in verses 8 and 9 of, of Galatians 3. And a scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, the Jews at that time had taken that line of the nations that will be blessed by you to mean, well, kind of like some Christians do today, that, hey, you're around me. You're you're blessed by me, aren't you? You know, they really thought that just by being around them, the Gentiles were going to be blessed. But the Bible says that it was one fact 
that from their line would come one person who would give the nations an opportunity to be a part of the family. Here's the crux of our message today. We are often told by the world that there are many shades of gray. And yes, there are some things that there's no right or wrong answer for. And it's true in, in whatever instance you look at it. Is it better to live in Texas or New York or Virginia or even Iowa? You know, is it too cold inside the building? You know, shades of gray. You know, if it's 60 for me, it's great. For others, I think it's 90. Um, but in life, there's also black and white. You're either dead or alive. You can't be both. You're either a Christian or you're not. There's no middle ground. You're either saved or not. Or, as Paul would later reveal, you're either saved by grace through faith or you're not at all. The Judaizers were saying, yes, Jesus saves, but his sacrifice means nothing to non-Jews. So obey the law. If you're a man, they're saying get circumcised as a sign that you made the leap to God's family and that you will follow the law of Moses from that point on. But now Paul demonstrates the futility of obeying the law for salvation in verses 10 and 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. See, it's one thing to say I'm following the Lord. It's another to do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. He's quoting Deuteronomy 27, 26 and Habakkuk 2, 4. About the high price of trying to follow the law and the righteous living by faith. And no, it's, you have to obey the entire law. You can't just pick and choose. You can't say, I'm going to obey the law a la carte. Oh, I agree with this, but this doesn't line up with what I believe today. No. He says, you must entire, written, all things written in the book of the law. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 5, 20, how futile it is to do it. He says, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes in order to, to, for, to enter the kingdom of heaven by the law. And these guys were the most righteous people materially or externally as they came. He says, you have to do better. And a person has, again, in James 2, uh, 10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. There are no little laws. There's no mortal law. It's all mortal law. If you break one little thing, it's eternity in hell. You see, if you go the law route, it's impossible to enter heaven. Paul points out that if the righteous are defined by their faith, there's a problem. But the law is not a faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Paul says the law is not a thing of faith. And yet, you're supposed to approach him in faith. And so it's not a means of righteousness, but it's a way for Jesus to redeem us by his death and sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled all the impossible requirements of the law, which allowed him to save us and spend eternity with us. <coughs> he then gives a great argument about the law's inability to save in verses 15 to 19. He says, let's give a human example Brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but by God who gave it to Abraham by a promise. And he makes two points here. 
First he says, it was made to Abraham and his offspring. And the ESV translation, I'm very disappointed because I'm like reading, I'm not a, an English major. I don't think offsprings is a word unless you're south of the border, or like the Mason-Dixon line border. Uh, but so offsprings, I mean, that's not really a word, is it, Kathy? Okay. Yeah, I don't think offsprings is a word. I, you know, but the word that's used there is spirma, and it means seed. And so the King James got it right. The King James says, the seed, not seeds. Uh, so it's better to put, use the King James or children or child uh, in that's a new living. So he looks at the promise of God, which was given 430 years prior, and said it was ratified by God, and it was ratified by God alone. You see, normally a covenant is made and ratified by two parties. They could be unequal parties, like man and God. But when they came to an agreement, it would be ratified, which made it put it into in practice. In this case, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar how, how the covenant came about. In Genesis 15, we won't go there. But it, it's really a disgusting thing back in that day and age. And it was a normal thing to do. Basically, you would take a heifer, a ram, a goat, and a dove and a pigeon, split them down the middle, put a space in between, and the two parties would walk between, and that ratified it. That made it an official document. But when it came to God and Abraham, Abraham didn't walk through. Only God did. God was knew that Abraham was, or his line wasn't able to keep his co the commandment at all, the covenant on their end at all. And this was an oath, remember, that God promised Abraham. He promised him in Genesis 12, 2, and 3. A promise of heirs, of lands, and blessings. But only God walked through. Remember, Abraham was in a dark stupor. He was watching this happen, and he saw God walk through. So God was saying, it's all about me. I'll take care of this. How could Abraham be uh, sufficient or responsible for something that his whole line would do. And so, when we read about the covenant, it's God's covenant to us. And only He could ever change it. And He doesn't change. In this chapter, Paul laid out four other things about the law. The law did not give people the Holy Spirit. The law did not give righteousness. The law did not justify a person. It only condemns you. The law could not change the fact that true righteousness can only come by faith in God's promises. Now, someone reading up to this point in Galatians might be asking, did Paul think the law served no purpose? Well, see, that brings up our next question. If we're not saved by the law, why did God give us the law? Which Paul goes on in, in verse 19 to 22. He says, why then the law? Good anticipation as a writer. It was added because of transgressions until this offspring, offspring or seed, would come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now the intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. In the law, then contrary to the promises of God, certainly not. For if a law has been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But Scripture imprisoned everything under the law so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those of belief. So Paul gives two purposes of the law. First, the negative point of view, to show what sin is. And I, I like the New Living Translation better on verses 19 to 20. Here's what it says. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. I think that says it pretty clearly. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave the law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is, who is, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. 
So the first part of the law is to show what sin is. You know, remember what Paul said in Romans 7. Uh, he said, you know, is the law sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Please understand what Paul is saying. The law doesn't create sin, but made people aware what sin is and what their state was. You know, and, and I always struggle with that. What does he mean that what, you know, I went, if I didn't covet, what does that mean? So here's an illustration I came up with, or I actually found. If we were to block out all the windows in this room, and I think, I think the meat kids had been in here once when we played hide and seek or something, uh, with all the, it gets pitch black in here. Now, I'll go in and arrange some chairs, and then we'll bring you in with the lights all off, pitch black. And I, we say, everyone run as fast as you can to this wall or to the cross. How many people are going to reach it without hitting a chair? No, nobody. Is that because, and then if we turn on the lights, how many people could do it? Well, all of us, well, there might be one or two that would slip up, but, but, but yeah, but why? Does the lights make the chairs appear? No, the chairs are always there. The, the difference is, is that now you can see them. And that's what Paul is saying. The law is like the light that shows the sins. It shows you the hopelessness of your situation. Now, there are some who think they'll be able to plead ignorance before the God. They, before God, they may say, "Well, you know, I, I didn't know that was against the law, God." They, but they avoid Bible studies and learning more about God. And and I think they think that when they go before God, they're going to say, "Yeah, I didn't know that was a sin." Oh, I, I didn't know this. And I think it sounds a lot like when you know Adam said, "Well, the woman you gave me caused me to sin." You know, everyone's responsible for their own sin load. But the Bible says in Romans 2, 14 to 16, for when Gentiles who did not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse and even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. No one's going to have an excuse. The law, whether it's written out by God or written on people's hearts or consciences, still reveals sin to us. Now, in a negative sense, it reveals the impossibility of our condition. The law also shows our condition is impossible by ourselves. For Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the response of the wages of that sin is death. Going into that dark room example again, it'd be like we fill the room up with chairs from the floor to the ceiling and say, anyone who doesn't get to the cross by in one minute dies. That's what you're facing. Without Christ. And while the Pharisees believed that following the, the law justified them, even they realized they couldn't do it. So they work, created workarounds. They started to do things that they said, well, that, that's just a symbolic law. That, we don't really have to obey that. You know, close enough became good enough. And the other thing the law did was to let people know their, the nature and will of God by giving them a way to live, helping them recognize that a God of love didn't make the law to make their lives harder, Gave them the law to protect them. The law also caused people to look for a savior. Because if you're in a room full of chairs and you have to get to the cross, you need someone to make a way for you. Verses 21 and 22 of Galatians 3. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law has been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But Scripture imprisoned everything under the law so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The law revealed people's need for a Savior. You can't do it on your own. Good people, there's going to be infinite number of, well, I can't say infinite, I'll get called out on that. 
a large number of good people will be in hell because they didn't turn their lives over to Christ. They had no one to pay for their sin because they wouldn't accept it. So we're not saved by works of the Lord, not even by the things we do, both good or, or better. But as Ephesians 2, 8-9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We can only be saved by God's grace. Grace means getting something that we do not deserve, something that we have not earned. Romans 11.6 also says, but it, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Grace plus anything is not grace. And so you cannot save yourself. You cannot take grace and say, this is the starting point. Now we're going to do other things and that will save us. It means nothing at that point. Only God has the power to save us. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Because of God's great mercy. Mercy means not getting something that we deserve. Because we're all sinners, without Christ, we all deserve hell and an eternity in hell. But God chose His mercy. Now, without God's mercy and grace, we all belong there. And before you say, how could a loving God send people to hell? Remember, the Bible says in John 3 that people chose darkness over light. They chose rebellion over submission to God. They chose to embrace sin of the that the world finds acceptable. People choose hell because they don't want God. And as I said, grace is a topic that gets blurred. There are those on the left and right of grace. It's like everything these days. Everything's extreme. On the extreme left, um, we have people who are very, not unsurprisingly, are like the Sadducees of the day. Um, I will not laugh. And I'm not laughing at the Sadducees. <laughs> but the Sadducees were noble families. They were well connected with the Romans. They lived for this life and this life alone. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in hell. They thought when you died, that was it. And because they didn't believe in the resurrection, that's why they were sad, you see. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible. The Torah or the law. But in the same breath, they were extremely secular in their religious practices. They were liberal in their willingness. They would accept the Greek religions, they would accept the Roman religions, all in the name of, of let's all get together and be together. Because this life's all there is, and it was all about earthly power and worldly pursuits. On the other side, the right-hand side, you had the Pharisees, who believed not only the Torah and the book of the laws and the prophets, but they had 630 man-made traditions as well that they counted equal to the law. Now remember, traditions mean they made it up themselves. The law was given by God. They wanted Jewish and, uh, people to, and religion to remain pure. They believed in angels and demons, and they believed in heaven and hell. And whereas the Sadducees were from noble birth, and they were considered aristocrats, many of Pharisees started out as just a common people. They were business owners. They were merchants who got far enough where they could spend time studying God's word and rise in stature because knowledge is power. And while they hated the Romans and had little influence over them, as we saw at Jesus' trial, they had a lot of power over the people because they came up from them. They had something in common. Besides, the two factions had something in common besides the hatred of Jesus. They were proud. So proud of who they were and what they had. And the hatred of Jesus was the only thing that would bring them together. So, how do those two groups of, of Jewish people from 2,000 years ago equal people today? Well, on one side, well, I guess my left side, you're right. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> you have people on this side who are in, believe in cheap grace. 
people who say things like, well, I said this in his prayer, I fulfilled my obligation. They'll even quote scriptures. They'll say, I'm not under the law, or I'm under grace. Romans 6.14. And because of that, I can live the best life now in this world. I can chase after all the worldly pleasures, and when I die, I'll have my fire insurance, and God is obligated to save me. People who, when all is said and done, are very hard to distinguish from the unsaved in the world. They believe in the power of political connections. They incorporate many values of the world into their beliefs. They have a hard time believing that sin has a price any longer. Because after all, didn't Jesus die for our sins? So sin is free, easy. You know, sin some more because then it's more grace, which Romans takes a, a thing at. We shouldn't sin. But these people believe that. And the second famous one that they, verse that they like is, judge not, lest ye be judged. Does anyone know where the term cheap grace came from? Actually, we, we, there's a guy's name that just keeps popping up. And I, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And he coined the phrase, cheap grace. The pre he said this, the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. Notice the emphasis on the benefits of Christianity without the cost that's involved in being a Christian. Remember, Jesus defined what the cost there's, there's a cost to being a Christian. And I don't mean putting money in the box. Let's flip over to Luke 14. Jesus laid out what the cost is. Luke 14, starting in verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And as I shared before, Jesus isn't saying that you have to hate your spouse or your family or anything. You know, that's a separate matter we can talk about privately if you have those issues. But what he's saying is your love for God should really make any other love that you have in your life seem like hatred. That's a great amount of love. He says in verse 27, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000 to meet him who is coming against him with 20? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he'll send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but salt has, if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? The path is hard and narrow for a Christian. If anyone says it's easy to be a Christian, they are liars. They're just up there with the Judaizers. We must not forget that. It's called a narrow, hard path for a reason. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Why would Jesus pay the penalty for your sin only to have you wallow back in, uh, into sin all over again? Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's on this side. Now on the other side, you have people who will say, yeah, grace is great. But remember, you need to still obey the law. God will be pleased with your obedience. After all, didn't He give it for a purpose? And so they will say, of course we're saved by grace, but grace must be earned through obedience to the law. So don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, don't hate. You better tithe, you better go to church, honor your mother or father. But see, here's where it gets deceptive. They will use these commands as a measuring rod for how much of a Christian you are. 
their version of lifting the hood. How did you give your tithe today? Did you give enough? I give a lot. How about you? Didn't see you in church today. Didn't see you in study today. And they aren't saying this out of love and kindness to people. They're saying it as a comparison to, to themselves to you. Please understand, grace plus anything as a means of salvation negates grace. In fact, Paul said in Galatians 5, verses 2 to 4, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who, are not been just, who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Think of what he's saying. He's saying if you try and do anything with grace and add to it as a means of salvation, you're going to be cut off from Christ. And Christ is the only one who can save us. This is strong words because this isn't something to be taken lightly. Grace isn't just one of those happy words that we throw around. There's deep meaning here. Now, some of you might be getting a little worked up and saying, well, Pastor, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. You say that being a Christian has a cost, but it's not about obeying the law. Let me be clear. There are many laws in Jewish society at that time, including those traditions. But Jesus, our Lord and Savior, said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And what were his commandments? Well, in Matthew 22, verses uh, 36 to 40, uh, a scribe came and asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. It begins with loving God. Not just with when you feel like it. Not just with what you can give up. You know, we were talking in Sunday school today. Sometimes it's easier to give God money than his time. Than your time. You know, God wants our whole time. We're supposed to be slaves of Christ. And that's a hard word because some people get very offended by the word slave. That's what the Bible says. So, we're supposed to love God with everything we have. Our love for God should make everything else seem like hatred while we're still loving them. And we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in this society today, we tend to love ourselves a lot. And this is a personal command. This is not a command to the whole church. It's to individuals. You are to love your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. And in love, we are to, as Paul would later write in Galatians 6-2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are not to forsake the gathering together. Hebrews 10-25, not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some, but encouraging one another. So there, that's twofer. You're supposed to not neglect gathering together, and you're supposed to encourage one another as you see the day drawing near. In fact, encouraging is also found in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. We are to deal with sin in the body, following what Matthew 18 says that Jesus gave us. We are to be ultimately poured out as a drink offering. That means hold nothing back, because when you pour out a drink offering, you hold a cup like this, there's no retirement for a Christian. You're supposed to give you every last drop. You know, remember... Uh, Abraham was 100 years old when, when he had his son. I couldn't imagine having a child when I was 50, much less 100. You know. and, and, I, and I guess it would be hard for a woman too. But, you know. but ultimately, we're supposed to pour everything out for God, holding nothing back. Ephesians 5.21 says we're supposed to be submitting to one another. Great thing there. Everyone likes to submit to one another. We are supposed to go into the whole world in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 and proclaim the gospel. The bottom line is, yes, we're not under the law, but it doesn't excuse us from ignoring the law that God gave us. Today, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, 
in Christ alone, period. And it doesn't give us rights to act like the world. We're supposed to be mature and growing in Christ with each day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you, Lord, for who you are, for the amazing gift of grace, Lord. Lord, we ask that you just work in our lives, Lord. Make our love be center and focused on you and you alone, Lord. Um, and don't let our eyes wander away uh, to other things of earthly value. Let it just be focused on you, Lord. And let's keep seeking to learn more about you and growing with you. In your name, amen. And our closing hymn.